Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and I, again, thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection and to lean into the LGBTQ experience by understanding our history, by understanding the stories, and by uh, drawing a uh, relationship and a connection to the queer community. Thank you again. I'm super excited for this episode, super excited to have Carolyn Pearson uh, on today's uh, podcast episode. She is uh, iconic Carolyn. She uh, <laughs> is part of the fabric of my story, and you'll find out um, as we have this discussion today uh, how much of a, a play she played in my life, not only post coming out or part of that process of coming out, but also um, as a young person growing up in Mormonism. For those of you who are watching on the video version of this podcast episode, we invite you to partic participate in the live chat and share your comments as we go through this episode. It's always fun to be able to have a, a real-time conversation with other people who are paying attention and listening and watching at the same time. And for those of you who are watching on the audio version, uh, sorry, listening uh, in the audio version of this podcast through one of our audio podcast players like Stitcher, uh, Spotify, iHeartMedia, Google, Apple, or any of the other players, we invite you to subscribe and to uh, subscribe and to com uh, connect with this uh, podcast player and connect with the uh, podcast episode through the audio side. You can find this podcast uh, and others anywhere you listen to your favorite audio podcasts. This podcast episode and other video episodes are also available on our website at LatterGayStories.org. Without further ado, I want to welcome to uh, the Latter Gay Stories podcast, Carolyn Pearson. Thank you for spending a little time with us, and welcome to the Latter Gay Stories studio. Kyle, it is an honor to be asked to come and be with you on this podcast, and I'm thankful to be here. This, I don't even know where we need to begin. Um, as you and I have discussed this episode, um, I think of all... I really see Carolyn Pearson as the OG when it comes to mixed orientation marriages, when it comes to better understanding a marginalized community, when it comes to doing what religion should do best, and that's loving, not othering. Maybe for those who yet um, or have not been able to experience um, Carolyn Pearson. Give us a brief background. Who is Carolyn Pearson? Where did you grow up? And, and tell us just an intro into your life. Sure. But first, uh, tell me what an OG is, because I don't even know. Uh, original. Sometimes it's original gangster, or it's, <laughs> it's the original. It is the... Uh, it's like Utah was the original place for fry sauce, so... <laughs> You, you are the OG. You're the original when it comes to mixed orientation marriages. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm very glad to have that figured out. <laughs> so, sure, my story. Mm, I have the deepest Mormon roots you're ever going to find. My grandmother, not my great, but my grandmother walked across the plains at eight years of age. I have a great-grandfather who was in the Mormon battalion, another great-grandfather who uh, sailed on the ship Brooklyn and then went on to be a founder of Mesa, Arizona. So my place in the church was just guaranteed, and there was never any question about d anything except learning all the beautiful things and the, the sacrifices that had been made to bring us here. And um, I was born in Salt Lake City. My parents were older when they had children. My, my mother had uh, twins, start, had her family starting at age 39, having twins first, followed by my brother, followed by me, then followed by my sister. We lived in Salt Lake for the first years, then moved out to Gusher, Utah. You have never heard of Gusher, Utah. Out in the... Oh, try me. Oh, I know you, exactly have you? where Gusher is. Where is it? It is on Highway 40 in between Duchesne and Uinta counties, and they call it Gusher because it was the first place in Utah that they gushed oil. 
That's a, a very nice little tidbit that very few people know about. We were there for five years, two of those years without electricity or running water in a little tiny farmhouse. My mother saved her money from school teaching to get us out of Gusher and into, into Provo. My father worked for the government teaching uh, veterans how to farm. So when we moved to Provo, sort of we were back in civilization, as it were, and I attended BY High School. Had a good experience there. Attended BYU, loved my time at BYU. Was in the drama department. I was in many fine plays. My favorite was when I got to play Joan of Arc. And sometimes I think, you know, maybe the first mistake the brethren made with me and my radicalness uh, was letting me play Joan of Arc on the stage of the BYU, Joseph Smith Auditorium stage. And I haven't been burned at the stake house yet. <laughs> and nor, nor will I be, let me mention that right off the bat, because my bishops have always loved me. My stake presidents have always loved me, and they still do. So uh, I'm really kind of an odd story. Let's see, going back to, to BYU, I, I got my master's in a theater and then taught school for a year at Snow College, saved my money so I could retire, traveled the world for a year. Um, I was in Russia at the time that President Kennedy was assassinated. I spent um, three months in Israel working on a kibbutz, studying Hebrew and working on the land, and gradually got my way back to the States and um, began, I, I worked for the BYU Motion Picture Studio for a period of time, doing church films and, um, and educational films, and, and that was a very rewarding and, and really good time. My boss was Scott Whitaker, a guy that I loved so much. He and his brother, Judge Whitaker, had been animators for Walt Disney. And I remember that time as a very, very happy time. And it was sort of during that time that I was um, back wanting to be in plays again. And so I auditioned and got a part in a play called The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder. And there was a young man in the cast that I just really fell for. He was a charming blonde man and his name was Gerald Pearson. And, and he and I developed a great relationship. He was just back from his mission to Australia. He was very dedicated to the church. And he thought I was so smart. We would go for walks. He lived not too far away from me. And he would come over to my apartment, and we would visit and visit. And one time he brought with him his, his notebook and said, I, I, I brought this notebook to write down all of the wise things that you say. <laughs> and that was fun. But see, I was sort of falling for him. And to make all of this story short... Gerald fell for me, too, the best that he could. And so we got engaged. And um, bef actually, before our engagement, he did um, tell me that he had something he needed to talk to me about. He said he'd been fasting for a couple of days. And so he told me that in his background there had been homosexual feelings and activity, but that's not who he really was. He said, that, that, that's not me. I, I love the church. I, I know what I need to do, and I know that I can. I know who I want to be, and I know that I want to be with you. And I accepted that. And as you know, back then, this is in the 60s, uh, we were all very ignorant of this whole phenomenon called homosexuality. 
and according to the church if if a young man and never nobody ever talked about women but if a young man got off on the wrong track and did some of that stuff he just repented just repented and found a good woman to marry and that was the end of it what was the mormon promise surrounding this topic in the 60s i mean the the church had this the church was grappling with a lot of the 1950s we had mccarthyism there were multiple arrests that happened up in idaho with members of the church in leadership positions who were found in compromising situations uh, in in uh, gay relationships homosexual relationships that had infiltrated down into salt lake church leaders are worried about it we had we had church leaders like Spencer Kimball, President Kimball, uh, Eldon Tanner. Um, we had Marky Peterson. We had Boyd K. Packer all on the scene speaking not always so favorably um, towards this community mm -hmm. of people. So as, as Gerald is telling you these things, you're both in Provo at BYU. As Gerald's telling you these things, is there something... Was there a dichotomy beginning, knowing that you knew who he was as a person, but also what the church was presenting as theology? Well, see, all of those things that you just mentioned, I didn't know anything about um, important people being arrested for whatever. That was, this whole thing was just brand new to me, totally brand new. I just sort of knew that that there were homosexuals who had sex together and but I didn't know any and I knew nothing more than what the church said was that if you get off on the wrong track you just repent so um, with that sketchy knowledge and with my real love for Gerald and see Gerald loved me he loved me as best he could really so I felt to move forward with the marriage, as did he, although he was terrified and he got cold feet once and just disappeared. And then after a couple of months, he came back and said, I really want to be with you. I really, I think this marriage is the right thing. So we, we married on September 9th of 1966 in the Salt Lake Temple for time and all eternity. And we really had a, a good marriage in a lot of ways. I have talked to gay men who were so horrified at the idea of consummating their marriage that they, they could not do it. That was not the case for Gerald and me. And um, so we had four children and in, in so many ways, a fun and a good, pers a mutually helpful marriage. Gerald learned early on that what he'd hoped for had not happened. And what, what was it that he hoped for? Well, of course, he had hoped that his inner workings would change, that he would no longer have any emotional, sexual yearnings to be with a man but that, that, uh, that would all be the way it was supposed to be, and that all of that would be directed in my direction. Was, it, was there ever a feeling on your part of being inadequate as a wife to help that process go forward? Saying well, that not perhaps then. I could do something different, perhaps... We seem to be doing all right. Even though Gerald personally knew that his his um, his whole emotional sexual system had not shifted, but I would dare to say that we had a better physical relationship than a lot of women that I knew with their heterosexual husbands. Anyway, after the four children and various things that happened. Um, and of course, it was Gerald who made me be a published author. I, I need to mention that. <clears throat> he, he loved these little poems that I was writing. 
and before we married, he, he was reading them. And just, so after we married, he said, we are going to publish these poems. And I thought, oh, come on. Nobody's ever going to buy a. But he said, nope, we're going to do it. So we borrowed $2,000 from, from the credit union that, uh, that I had at BYU. And, uh, and he went about the business of putting this thing together and got our dear friend Trevor Salvey, who many of you will know, to, to do those beautiful illustrations. And, and the, so Gerald um, spearheaded putting out this lovely little book of poems called Beginnings. And that was a phenomenon. It was a fluke, or maybe my fate, that it, it immediately just began to sell, just by the dozens, and then by the hundreds. And there was a period of time when Deseret Book ordered 500 copies a month from us. This was just unheard of. I was stunned, and Gerald was thrilled. And so this sort of became, um, uh, well, this was the way we earned our living for quite a while. And I became something of a household name in Mormondom for that. What was the context of the poems? Why, why did they resonate so well with the Latter-day Saint community? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, but somehow... And, and they, they were not, all of them, necessarily LDS, but they all had the, the same kind of spiritual feeling. And somehow, what I offered in that little book resonated with what people wanted at the time. And there wasn't very much what we called Mormon art going on. But this thing just came out of the blue, and somehow people just loved it. And uh, I really, I, I use the word fluke sometimes. Um, but Gerald, and as Gerald might talk about it in the, in the future, he, he said, you know, you, you were not just meant to write those simple little poems. You were meant to write other kinds of things with some really large import. So I am perfectly willing to say that I would never have become a published writer without Gerald. I mean, who but a dear queer husband would insist on publishing his wife's poetry? Nobody. But that's what happened in this case. And, and that put me on the map and opened up the doors to everything else that I have written. So I have to be very grateful to Gerald for that, as well as a number of other things. Tell us a little bit about your family. From that marriage, you were able to have to build a family together. We did. We had um, four children. We first had a girl named Emily. Then we had a boy that we named John. And then soon after that, a boy we named Aaron. And then um, a little girl... It was a surprise to both of us, uh, named Katie. So we had those, and uh, Gerald loved being a father, and he was a fun father. My children's playmates were envious of the kind of family that we had, and, and the fun, fun father that, that Gerald was to my children. So in Provo, we, we had in many ways a kind of idyllic experience. And, you know, Gerald um, used the money to do other things. He, um, he published some of Marvin Payne work and, and others. And to make all of this short, we, we got into some f financial difficulty and we had to move. And, uh, and I said, well, if we're going to really move, let's move to California. Why ca what was in California? Gerald had spent some time in the Bay, Bay Area with some programs and he said it was just the most wonderful artistic place. And he had stayed in with some friends that he had met in the mission field in, in Walnut Creek. And he just loved the place. So anyway, we decided that we would move there and rent. And to see, I, but before we moved, 
we, we both knew that our marriage was in jeopardy because Gerald knew and he had confided in me and I had learned some things and we both knew that he wasn't going to manage to maintain the marriage forever. And I, if, if there was going to be a divorce, I did not want it to happen in Utah where I was a public person. So for several reasons, we, we did move to Walnut Creek. Uh, and um, so all of the, uh, the complexities then started from there. I was, yeah, that, and that made me just wonder. We're now talking about a time where the LGBTQ community was seeing a rise in California. And I, I'm just curious, and, and maybe you had this discussion with Gerald, if there was a personal reason for him moving closer to Mecca, um, groups of people that were more like him, a society that was better apt to understand and show compassion? Um, I expect so. And as for myself, see, I don't look back and say, oh, if only we had never moved to California. These, these kinds of stories were about to happen all over the country. There, there were people in, in Utah who were dying of AIDS. And so anyway, we, and I did, I did, I felt that it would be a good thing to, to move there. And, and, and so we did. From there, you say that the marriage was somewhat tumultuous. And we, we know, spoiler alert, that you did divorce. So sure. And uh, see, there was a time when it, Gerald was hopeful that he could have his gay life and his life with me at the same time. And I, and I was not able to do that. Are you saying like a um, open marriage? Yeah. He Which was, was hoping for that. Which was somewhat well. unheard of in, in terms of the way Mormonism functions, um, especially in that time period. No, and, and I, I, I would, that was never within my realm of possibility. So we just made a determination to end the marriage and to remain good friends which we were able to do. My question is how? I, I meet so many Latter-day Saint women uh, as the straight spouse in mixed orientation marriages who cannot fathom this idea of building a relationship with a spouse that in many circumstances betrayed them. And that's a reality for mixed orientation well, marriages. Please don't think that I did not have my share of anger. Anger at Gerald, anger at God, betrayal, and arguing with Gerald. Look, you, you, you've, you started this family. You have children. You, you can't just abandon ship and choose a different life. You've chosen this life. And anybody who has read Goodbye, I Love You will know some of the conversations that we had. And uh, such as, and he always called me Blossom. Blossom, if I could cut off this arm and get rid of this thing that I experience, I would do it. But it's not just, this is not just a sexual thing. This is something of my entire person. I think it's, it's part even of my spiritual being. And all of this was strange to me, but I, I knew that this was a reality for Gerald. I knew it. And see, we had been dealing with this for so long. And, and I'm, I, I, didn't want, I did not want my children to inherit hate. And I, I can't tell you precisely how or why, but I, I was able to find a way to let Gerald go without, without the major emotion being one of, of hatred. And we did talk through enough that we were both determined that we could re uh, retain our friendship. And we did. You bring up the book, Goodbye, I Love You. Why? 
write a book about you left Utah to escape the public yeah. version of you, the, the way Mormonism would likely discuss your marriage yeah. and your life. But then you get to a point where you're willing to open that story to a worldwide audience. Why? And that would have been a terrible surprise to me, too, except that I lived through it. And, see, uh, Gerald and I never talked about the idea that, that I would write. And in spite of the fact that he was the one who made me a writer, a published writer, he really was. And that I had continued to write books that w w were the, the, the support of our family. W it never occurred to me, and we never had a conversation that I would write our story. It was just too shameful. But in answer to your question, this is how it happened. And I remember a couple of weeks after the death, I was at his apartment in San Francisco helping some of his gay friends uh, clean out his things. And I, I remember I, I, I went out for a walk just along some of the blocks near to his house. And somehow it, it it just occurred to me you know if if it were possible that i could write our story it might be useful for a lot of people this was a time when across the country and certainly in san francisco there were a lot of young gay men who had been thrown out of their houses kicked out of their churches dying now on the streets of San Francisco of AIDS. And I, I, I thought suddenly, <sighs> would I dare, would I, could I even do it to write this story? Um, but it gradually became a strong impulse in my mind and my heart that knowing that Gerald and I both had learned such a lot from our relationship and from this last terrible part of it that it might be useful for other people and so I, I quickly was able to get an agent for this and he sold the story to Random House in New York who and, and the death happened in 84 and the, um, the book came out the two years later in, in 86. And it was quite a phenomenon. And Random House had me on all of the morning shows, Good Morning America. And I had my little moment with Oprah. And then uh, a major thing, uh, Sunstone had a major event for me in Utah. And, and that was a remarkable time. Oh, but, but the, the most astonishing thing about that was when the book was just, just almost prepared, I got an, uh, a phone call from my person I was working with at Random House who said, we've just received a, a request for an advanced copy from a, a bookstore in Utah called Deseret Book, and they would like to read the book. And I, I remember my heart just froze, and I thought, I'm not ready for this. If I, don't I know turn it into happen. the Mormon market, everybody will know. Yeah. I said, I, well, I, I knew this would be coming up, but I, I, when it happened, I thought, I, I, I can't, can I even bear this? And then, um, or, 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 or what will happen to my career? What response will I get from the Mormon people? But about ten days later, she wrote or she um, phoned me back and said, "The Desra book has ordered a thousand copies, and they want to know if you will do a couple of book signings, one in one in Salt Lake at on the weekend that they call General Conference, and and another one in in Orem, 
And I really get emotional every time I, I think about that because at that moment I knew that it was going to be okay. That in the Mormon community, there would be a lot of people who would understand and, and who would, as I had hoped, learn something from the story. And that indeed is, is what happened. As you know, I was, I was just besieged with people who, well, at, at this first um, book signing in, in Salt Lake at Deseret Book, by the time we arrived there, the, lo the line was long of people who had bought the book and were waiting for me to sign it. And everybody was quiet. It was like we were at a funeral. It was just kind of like a sacred sort of thing. And people whispered, and and I I just knew that every book I signed was for someone who had needed this story for a long, long time. What was, what is the story of Goodbye, I Love You? Well, it's a love story, and it is the story of Gerald and me falling in love and having children, and and then having to have our love tested with this gigantically difficult thing of his homosexuality and and uh, and of course the way that we handled that so that um, so that we were able to transform our relationship from from married people to friends that is the story of it and and then comes the more difficult part of the story as in the early 80s this strange thing appears that seems to be particularly present for gay men this terrible thing called HIV that led to AIDS and certainly unquestioningly to death and so that, that national and international story intersected with our personal story. And um, so our, Gerald and my relationship was strong enough that the children and I helped him through the worst times. And um, by the time he was diagnosed with AIDS, and he had, he had not wanted to be tested because he was afraid. But I assumed that he did have it for a while. And then when he, he, w he called and said, yes, Blossom, I, I tested positive. I have HIV. And um, so it was less than a year between well, only maybe six months between that and and uh, then the death, and um, at, at the end, Gerald was staying in my home, where I was taking care of him, and and that's where he passed away. So that's that's the story of goodbye. I love you. I joined my personal story with those who waited in line in Salt Lake City on General Conference weekend. Mm. For me, I was in a mixed orientation marriage as well. I followed that same Mormon message. Do all that was right, all that was required of you, and this will all go away. And eight years after marrying my wife in the temple, the Vernal Temple, so that's how I know about Gusher. Ah. I did my very best to be a Latter-day Saint. And I was in, I was checking all the boxes and I was still gay. And I came out to my wife in March and we had four young kids. We had 
a white picket Mormon life. I was serving in leadership callings in the church. She was raising our four children. Mm -hmm. And I turned her whole world upside down. Yeah. As your world was turned upside down. Yeah. And as tumultuous and difficult as that process was, if ever I felt unconditional love, it was in those moments of connection with my wife. And I recognize all these feelings of betrayal and the trauma that comes with that separation. The reality that as much as we try, things just aren't changing. And in the midst of that coming out experience and our subsequent process through that navigation, I came home one day to find on my wife's nightstand a copy of Goodbye, I Love You, a book that I had never before seen in my life. And it changed our relationship. Wow. I'm so glad. It brought words to a wife who was grieving. It brought emotion to a topic that for the very reasons that you moved to California were the reasons why we avoid talking about sexuality and gender identity and Mormonism. The shame, the guilt, the pain. But for some reason, something in Goodbye, I Love You, the purity of the story, the raw emotion of the text, compels each of us to look inward and see people for who they are not policy, not something that was spoken of over a pulpit. But in my opinion, Goodbye, I Love You was the epitome of love with an unfortunate ending. Yeah. But a reciprocal purpose. Here we are all these years later, nearly 40 years after you published the book. We're in an interview together discussing yep. this topic, a book. And how monumental Carolyn Pearson was to this landscape. In my opinion, I mean, I've, I've longed for this interview because I hope the world understands how influential, I hope Carolyn Pearson realizes how influential she was at paving this road for so many queer Latter-day Saints who have come before. That, in my opinion, goodbye, I love you, and the results of what that book was able to do for this community magnified and fast forwarded our trajectory, our ability to overcome the hard things to get to places of peace and security and authenticity and honesty. So for that, I want to say thank you. Thank you. And I, I do know that that is true, Kyle, because I have heard from so many, many gay LDS men, wives of, parents of, and, you know, just, just human beings who, who did not have any connection to the subject, just saying thank you for helping me understand something that I had no way of understanding. So I know, and, and I know that Gerald was and is deeply grateful to me for writing the book and then just thrilled to see how many thousands of people really have been blessed by the understanding that was given of what he and I lived through. You obviously made a dent in the ability to navigate this topic. Did that set Carolyn Pearson up for a platform to recognize and to help the marginalized communities within Mormonism? Oh, sure. Sure. I, you know, especially the marginalized communities around, you know, the, the subject of homosexuality. Uh, that I, I began to hear from people all the time, and I, I did speak to groups. So sure, that I, I, I publicly put myself out there with my story. 
and and I know you can't just tell a story like this and then run away from it. You can't. So in, in fact, I remembered only recently that that I put a second phone line in my house so that I'd be able to talk to all the people R right, you know, right after my, uh, my tour of the country uh, that Random House sent me on. I thought it, it's not fair not to be able to speak to people who, who saw me speak and, and want to talk to me. So, so yes, I had numerous conversations with with LDS people, certainly, and with other people as well. It seems to me, just looking at this topic from th through the lens of history, chronology, this also gave you an opportunity to speak to other issues within Mormonism, people of color, women's rights, polygamy, which... In many instances, there were Latter-day Saints who were excommunicated for even breaching these topics. But Carolyn Pearson remained a voice for the voiceless. How did that happen? Hmm. Well, I think that was my calling when I came to Earth to do something like that. But I don't know that you would, and maybe, maybe people don't understand that, <clears throat> that long before I became a gay rights activist, I was a feminist. I was born a feminist. I looked around and I said, what's wrong with this picture? And so I was determined um, way before Gerald and I got together to to do work for women. And I, I may even have already written a few poems that had that as a, a, a theme. But it was very clear to me how patriarchy was providing a space for both men and women that was unfair to both of them. That, that we did not have an equal valuing and clear uh, into high school. Yes, you mentioned polygamy. <laughs> I will never forget the day that our, our dearly beloved um, seminary teacher bore us his testimony that when we young women were sufficiently unselfish and righteous, we will understand the principle of God's special form of marriage for the celestial kingdom and that we would yearn to live that and that's what we would do if we were righteous in in heaven uh, that was so shocking to me and it put a great breach between me and God for a long time and uh, everything I everything I learned growing up I was highly valued. I was one of the smartest kids in the class. But I always knew that because of my religious framework, in heaven I would be a second-class citizen. I knew that. And, uh, you know, because everything important from God on down to the deacons was being done by men and boys. So, yeah, by the time I met Gerald, I was already on fire as a feminist. I'm curious if there was a correlation between uh, Gerald's sexua sexuality Absolutely. and polygamy. Uh, yeah, right. In, in your view. His, uh, we both had these gender questions to resolve. And Gerald was very supportive of all of the work that I did for women. It was in our early, well, directly after beginnings, I, I wrote two LDS books, one called Daughters of Light, about the early spiritual experiences of Mormon women, another called um, the, <laughs> uh, the whatever, it, about, about the, um, the pioneer women, the flight and the nest, about pioneer women 
doing wonderful work in, in education and in the professions. And Gerald was excited to see, th and he, he published those books. And our little, our little company that, that published Beginnings. So yes, I was, I was firmly established. And the concept of the, the missing mother in heaven, that haunted me forever. And I knew it was wrong. I knew from the get-go. It was not her fault. It was not his fault. It was our fault. Men, le the leadership of the church who had created these dichotomies. Yeah. The name of your book, just I think for listeners' sake, uh, concerning polygamy. Is The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, That's Haunting the Hearts and Heaven of Mormon Women and Men. A very, very important book. Yeah, I urge everyone who has not read that to get a copy. So did, did you become untouchable to Mormon leadership? Had your clout grown so strong that you discussing these difficult topics shielded you from church persecution in terms of your membership? I'll... I will never know what kinds of conversations were held about me in, in Salt Lake City. Um, but I'll tell you one thing, that uh, when I was doing Mother Wove the Morning, the one woman play in which I, that I performed over 300 times in, um, in Utah, in California, in uh, all across the country, and even abroad, playing 16 women throughout her history in search of the female face of God. My dear stake president did tell me, yes, I get, I get calls from Salt Lake City about you. And this was in the 90s, you know, when difficult things were happening in the t for, for um, liberal-leaning people in the church. But my state president said, <clears throat> and I, I later learned it was seven different times he'd received calls about me. But he said to me, um, when I get a call from Salt Lake about you, and they say, should we be doing something about Sister Pearson? I say to them, leave her alone. She does better PR for this church than you could ever buy. Leave her alone. So I have, I have had tremendous support from my local leadership, and I have never given them cause. I've never done anything within the chapel, said anything um, to cause a, a, a problem. And all of my bishops and state presidents have been not, not just tolerant, but very, very kind to me and, and using me in important ways. Seeing where the church has... Uh, started uh, when you entered into the topic of sexuality and religion and seeing where they're at today do you see difference do you see a trajectory that is positive uh, from your pew what is a, your take on gay mormonism a, a very very slow long trajectory of positivity and i know that that it is not taught now that that it would be a good thing for a gay man to marry a woman and he would just get cured. That went by the wayside. And, and there's, a, you know, a, an, an ongoing understanding of science is, so that it's not really taught from the pulpit that this is just a, a, a bad choice. But there is an understanding that there is something uh, innate in a person who feels um, attraction for the other sex. But of course, even with, with that understanding, they, they fall back on the ecclesiastical insistence that nevertheless, this is a, um, this is a burden you have been given to bear. And we're glad to have you in our pews. Um, but it is not acceptable to act on your sexual in interests toward another of someone of your same gender. So 
as we know, there's, uh, but especially because of the fact that today almost everybody has a gay brother or a, gay, a lesbian aunt or certainly some neighbors who are gay, certainly people in the business world that you work with that are gay. N nobody has the the blind consciousness that uh, that we sort of had way back when Gerald and I got together. And it's my understanding that uh, that at least half of, of uh, the Mormon population would be in favor of of allowing gay marriage. Is that a correct understanding from I, what you see? I just actually saw this. Um, there were statistics put out by uh, the Utah legislature or of Utah voting blocks, and 61% yeah. of Republicans uh, approve same-sex relationships, same-sex marriages. 94% uh, of the Democrats. and In Utah? In Utah. And 59% of the Latter-day Saints. 89% uh, of uh, youth or young adult Latter-day Saints. Well, <laughs> that is a very strong indication that here we have something that is not going to go backwards. So, you know, and it, it's, it's not our business. You know, I, I have for a long time tried to follow a, a very wise statement from a, 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 a woman philosopher, Byron Katie, who says, everything in the world is either your business or their business or God's business. And if you, if you try to get into somebody else's business, it doesn't work. And you can't get into God's business. So you, if you stay in your own business, that's where you have the power. So I am willing to say absolutely what the leadership of the LDS Church chooses to do about women's issues, about LGBT issues, that is not my business. It is none of my business. But I am very clear on what my business is. And my business is to make sure that they understand the pain of what's happening down here at the bottom with women uh, and, and, and the pain that is happening with the LGBTQ people. That is indeed my business. And I will perform my business. And I do. See, I, I sent a copy of No More Goodbyes to all the general authorities. And No More Goodbyes was the follow-up to Goodbye, I Love You. This right. was something you wrote uh, probably a decade after? Yes, yes. And, and the play Facing East was done about the same time that, that No More Go Goodbyes came out. And then when I did um, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, I, I sent two copies in a package to every general authority, not all the 70s, but all of the, uh, the Quorum of the Twelve and the uh, First Presidency, and uh, a, a copy signed to him, to her, to his, his wife, very respectfully, saying, with sincere appreciation and hope that you will lead us into a period that is truly past polygamy. What and response have you received from none. general authorities? None. A and I, and I, I don't expect to. Well, excuse me, when I, when I sent uh, No More Goodbyes, I did receive three letters back just saying, thank you for the work that you do. I appreciate receiving this book. Um, but see, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy is a kind of a whole difficult bag in which I make a statement that it is my sincere belief that Brother Joseph made an error that God never was involved in polygamy. But nevertheless, I, I sent that to them. So th th that, is, uh, that is my business, to make certain that the leaders of my church understand the pain that is caused by the ongoing presence of this terrible, 
concept of eternal polygamy in the next life and the inequality of the sealing practices. That is my business, and I do it. And you have not given up writing. You just released another book. Why would I give up writing? The Love Map. I hope you never do. <laughs> well, and uh, see, after The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, I wrote a book that I think is hugely important, a book of poems called Finding Mother God. And see, this concept of the mother part of deity that we generally call Heavenly Mother is a very large topic today. And uh, the, the poems that I wrote in that book, and I, if anybody is listening to this podcast, do get yourself a copy of Finding Mother God. It is so important. This is one of the issues that is absolutely important today, that we, we revision our idea of heaven and bring back into our consciousness a partnership that we can call father and mother together. I, f I slowly see the church moving in a direction where they are honoring the role of women in Mormonism. Just at Deseret Book recently, I saw a painting of, of uh, early Mormondom, but a woman giving a blessing in Deseret Book. There are some of those things happening. Yes, and that is good. That I, is good. I believe that's a testament of good work like pe from people like you who were able to break those glass ceilings, burst through those barriers, and show Mormonism how to be Christ-like. Oh, sure. And see, there are thousands of women like me in the church who have been doing writing and wonderful artwork and all kinds of things that, that bring a new stature to the position of women. And, and, and this, too, is not going to go away. It is just going to, to get more and more beautiful and more and more attention. So, yes, that is a, a book that I, that I urge people to get. And then did you want to mention this most recent small book that I came out with only a few, uh, ten days ago, maybe? I do. I want to talk about The Love Map. The Love Map. Subtitle, Saving Your Love Relationship and Incidentally Saving the World. It's a, it's, it's a short book. It's, a, it's fiction, but it's true. And it, it takes us on, on a journey through a, wo a woman's life who had an idyllic, beautiful, romantic love and marriage. And then, you know, all the stuff happens. The quarrels, the this and the that. And he never cleans the stove right. And he leaves his dirty socks on the floor of the bedroom. And he doesn't, pick, he, he doesn't uh, buy the theater tickets that he said that he would. The, and so all, uh, as, as happens with most marriages, tension comes in. And, and, and tension can really, really build until it looks like, well, she sees this meme that says, the, the wagon of love breaks under the burden of life. And she just starts to cry because that's what has happened to her. You know, that lo love should just live forever in its first beautiful stages, but it doesn't. And, and anyway, just to give you a tiny taste of this. She, she works for Google, and she sent on an assignment to Jerusalem. And uh, there, as a result of a, of a bomb accident, or in, in, in a cafe, she is injured. And anyway, she, um, during the middle of the night, she's sent home with a light concussion. She's woken up by a vision. Joanna has a vision. She meets her higher self, who tells her, tells her, Joanna, you have been called here on a hero's journey. 
you have been saying, what is love? Why is it so hard? It, it's just hit and miss. Joanna, there is a map. There is a map to love, and you have come here to find it. So Joanna's higher self takes her on this hero's journey that really is based in the, the beautiful seven steps of what uh, we have learned as the chakra system, which I call the seven kingdoms because I just like that word. And so she has to learn. And when I learned about this really, Kyle, I was just so excited that this, these seven steps are, are steps that, that civilization takes, that relationships take, and this is not new religion happening here. This is just a new and very efficient way to journey toward love, which every religion has taught us about. Every single one has the golden rule and directs us to the heart. So Joanna learns about the first kingdom, which is survival. The second, which is creativity and sexuality. The third, which is the abdomen, which is power and will. And uh, that civilization has utilized each of these in, in, in impressive ways. That's how we have learned. That's how we've developed who we are. And the third kingdom is one that is very, very important of building things but if you're stuck there, then that's not good. And that's where fi Joanna finds that she is stuck in the third kingdom of my will over your will of, of conflict. And her calling is to rise just these six inches into the heart, which is the fourth kingdom, which is where God lives and where a relationship can truly be pure and based on, on your Whatever is good for you is good for me, not my will over yours. So I don't want to tell too much about all of that, but it's, it's a delicious story. I, I loved writing it. I just loved it. So I, I hope I have just given enough to interest you in, 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 in buying it. Where the do we the pick love up map. a copy of the love map? Pardon me? Where do we pick up a copy of the love map? Um, Amazon has it, and uh, also people always get signed copies of my work when they order them through me at my website, which is just carolynpearson.com. What do you want to leave the world with when people look back on Carolyn Pearson and her contributions to society? What do you hope the world sees from your efforts and your works? I hope, <laughs> I hope that, that the world sees that, my, that, that, that I and my work have been useful. Useful. You know, I, I had a conversation years ago with a, a grandson. We were talking, uh, I don't know why we were talking about what I should have on my gravestone. But I said, you know, I wouldn't mind having on my gravestone. She was useful. See, you know, a, 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 a lot of my writings, well, I, I am not a museum quality poet. I, I, a lot of my things are good, but I am not a museum quality poet. But my writing has been useful. You know, there's a, there's a lot of really great literature that may not be entirely useful. My stuff will likely not be known as great literature, but it will be known by the people who read me and appreciated me that it was useful. I was useful. And, and I'm thrilled to know that because I hear it from people all the time, all the time. As you know, we happen to be here now. I just finished doing the the Restore Conference, and I couldn't walk two feet without being besieged 
by people who hugged me and said, oh, I have to tell you about how, how wonderful it was with this, uh, this one of yours and that one of yours. And, 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 and that's, that's enormously gratifying because I changed, I changed lives with my work and I lift lives with my work. And, and there's nothing, nothing in anybody's occupation or profession that is more rewarding than that. To the queer Latter-day Saint or to the queer person uh, who is adjacent to Mormonism, who listens to this episode, who reads your works, what is your message to them about love? <laughs> Nothing that they haven't heard before again and again and again. Nothing that the great leaders of all the world have not taught. Nothing that Jesus has not taught. I have nothing new to bring to that. Just that we are here in this world to learn how to love. And, and in, in, in the, the terms of this recent book that I mentioned, we are here to learn to grow. And I like the LDS concept of eternal progression. We are here to, to learn from the most basic up and up and up because love is the place that we seek for. The love is the only place that will make us happy. If we settle down here in the third kingdom of just my, my will, my power, that's not where happiness is. Happiness is right here in the heart where love is. So I have nothing new to add just to remind us that our heavenly parents did send us on this hero's journey to learn, to stumble, to figure out what works. And, and we know, we know that non-love does not work. And as we see it, as, as we look at it today on the news and what's happening in different countries and what's happening in our country, we know that non-love does not work. And we see these combatant, these combatants that are ready to kill each other. That will never work. I mean, you can kill somebody, and that's a temporary whatever it is. But to create a system that works, no matter what it is, to create a business system that works has to be, we might not call it love, but it has to be a win-win. To create a marriage that works has to be love. Has to be. Even when you don't feel like it, you have to have a, some kind of a container that is what Jesus gave you that says, you know, love your enemy, love, your, love the stranger at the gate, love everybody. So um, those of us who have been around long enough to, to read history and to look at the world in times past and to look at the world today and, and to look at our family experience, our friendship experience, our own, our marriage experience, the only thing that works is love. And when romantic love fails, then we have to rely on brotherly love, sisterly love. And of course, that's what Gerald and I did when our romantic love was nowhere to be found. We still had love. He loved me deeply, and I loved him. So, you know, love is the thing. It just is. It's what we came here to find, to do. It's the thing that will save the world. If enough people understand that, that is the thing that will save the world. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to talk about? Any other last messages to the podcast community? Nope. 
Just live and love, that's all I know. And you have so beautifully put that into words for all of us to enjoy. Thank you. And thank you for letting me have my voice. I, I am thrilled that my voice has been utilized, that my voice has been valued, that you have asked for my voice. And, um, you know, the, the voice is the, the thing we have to say, I love you. And so for, for those who are listening, use your voice more than you do to say, I love you. And to the, to the people who are listening, those that I don't know, I know that just because you exist, I love you. And I want you to love and to feel and to be loved. Because what we know is that the one thing that, we, that I know for sure about God is that wonderful statement, God is love. And because we are little tiny portions of God, we too are love. And we can forget that. But when we remember, that's the only time that we're effective, that we're giving and receiving, and that we're happy. So let us love. I love you, Carolyn. I love you for all that you were able to do for me and my family and for our community. Kyle, I thank you, and I love you too. I do. Carolyn Pearson, author, poet, some have said iconic oh. Latter day Saint. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners uh, of this episode. If you are watching on the video version, please share your comments and uh, let us know of your love for Carolyn Pearson, uh, for the wonderful things that she has done, not only for Mormonism, but for each of us, uh, for humanity uh, at large to connect one another. I think it's just beautiful, the many things that she was able to do for us. Again, thank you for those who have participated in this episode. If you are watching uh, on our video version, again, we invite you to share this episode uh, with your family and friends. We invite you to make a comment. And if you are listening on an audio version of this podcast episode, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also to share it uh, as well. We thank our many listeners of the Latter Gay Stories podcast and those who interact and share our content. It's the Latter-Gay Stories podcast where we're able to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community through story and through uh, unified uh, understanding. It's stories like Carolyn's, it's stories like mine, and it's stories like yours that help us each to continue writing our own Latter-Gay story. <laughs>